Chantal Ballon. Before I start, I've got two gifts to give. Could Francis O'Grady and Nigel Costi please come to the stage? I want to say thank you to Francis and the TUC for the support they've given over many, many decades to the Toll Puddle Festival and ensuring that we understand the history where we come from, the better we can understand where we're going. I want to thank Nigel, as Secretary of the Southwest TUC, for the incredible work he does and all his friends and supporters do all across the Southwest to bring us all together here every year in this beautiful village to celebrate this village's contribution not just to our history not just to our national story but to the world trade union movement and I'd like to present each of them with a copy of a little known little known book that's now in its third reprint and it says to Francis thanks for all you and the TUC do for all of us and to Nigel, thanks for all you, the brilliant work done at the Toll Puddle Festival. And it's a copy of For the Many, Not the Few. Have you ever heard of it before? Thank you. I didn't quite hear that, never mind, thank you, thank you. Can I also ask you to put your hands together to thank Emma and Katie, who are the two signers that have been working here for all our speeches this afternoon. And for the work they do in their union of British Sign Language interpreters, because if we are to be an effective, inclusive movement, we must be inclusive of all at all times. So I thank Southwest TUC for ensuring this happens and for them for being here today. All those that have come have brought their banners, brought their history and brought an understanding of the history of our movement here to Toll Puddle this weekend. And it's become the most incredible weekend of music, discussion, debate, festivities and essentially people coming together discussing what they can do to create the kind of world we want for our children. How we can transform and change political debate. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens because people come together in strength to achieve support for those who are denied power in so many parts of the world. Denied trade union rights, denied human rights, denied so many things. Internationally, as well as nationally, as well as locally, we must be equally intensive and equally strong. And I thank all those groups that have come here this weekend and helped us to better understand the rest of the world. Yes, we celebrate our rights, of course, and we celebrate what those six very brave farm labourers did all those years ago. They were faced with a horrible situation. Greedy, powerful landlords that not only owned the land, but were busy changing the land through industrialization of agriculture at the same time as the Industrial Revolution was creating such mayhem in major cities all over Britain. Common land was being enclosed and many farm workers denied any right of individual survival. And they stood up against that. They stood up, they took an oath together, and they were arrested, and they were then taken to the Dorchester Assizes and sentenced to transportation. Their families suffered, the community suffered, and this was the powerful hitting back and saying, you might be affected by these massive changes that are happening in our society, but just remember this, we are in charge. Well, that's what they thought they were. And so they thought the whole thing was done and dusted when those six people were transported to Australia. But they weren't. They weren't because it lit a spark, it lit a flame that spread across the whole country and trade unionism grew as a result of the oppression of those six farm labourers. Those six farm labourers suffered that the rest of us might have rights 
to form a trade union, that workers would have rights against an employer, that workers would have rights in a society. We pay the most massive tribute to them for what they suffered at that time. But we also thank all of those that stood up in support of them at a time when there was no access to newspapers, television and radio were more than 100 years or 150 years away and the internet, nobody had ever thought of the possibility of such a thing. They mounted those campaigns by public speaking tours around the country in support of the Dorchester labourers. And that led in turn to the growth of trade unions and to the growth of chartism and the growth of so many other demands and led eventually to much greater democracy which led to the development of trade unions even further and the foundation of the Labour Party as a result of that. Our history, so much of it, started here in this small and very beautiful part of Dorset. We pay tribute to them, we thank those that have organised this festival this weekend and we say to our children, our teachers and our future, never forget where we've come from because if we do, we'll never know where we're going. But trade union rights were attacked then and attacked continuously after that. With every advance of trade unionism came a reversal as successive Tory governments tried to prevent trade unions having political funds, trying to prevent trade unions making political statements and tried to control their activities and their funds. We've seen attacks on the trade unions from the Taft failed judgment to the way the miners' strike was treated and I tell you this, a Labour government will start with an inquiry into Orgreave and what went on there. And, of course, the most recent Trade Union Act that has been passed in this country. The newspapers, owned by powerful people, and powerful people in our society, always try to condemn trade unions, always believe that every problem belongs to a trade union. So, for example, Southern Rail run an appalling service, get paid a great deal of money for running an appalling service, get paid even more money when the service becomes even more appalling, and apparently not one part of this problem is anything whatsoever to do with the relationship between government and Southern Rail. Yay. Apparently it's all the responsibility of those that work on the railways and try to keep our railways running and safe. Well, I've got news for Southern Rail. We think you should be in public ownership. Yay. And there are issues, there are many issues of workers' rights within our society. The Taylor Report was published this week. Published because it was supposed to be attending to the issues of workers' rights within our society. It hasn't done anything of the kind. It hasn't done that. It's a huge missed opportunity because workers' rights are under threat. Many workers feel they cannot join a trade union or get representation. And so we have to do something very, very different. Now this government appears to run out of ideas and indeed Theresa May went on television the other day to say she was open to lots of ideas and I'm, I'm always happy to help anybody who's got a problem. I'm always happy to cross the road to people that have got any difficulty as we all are. It's a natural human response and a natural human condition. So we did indeed cross the road and took a copy of For the Many, Not the Few across to Downing Street that they might be able to... Uh, put that into operation. Um, I somehow rather doubt that I need to wait too long for a response to it because I think they will find some of the manifesto, if not all of it, totally unpalatable to them. Because we start from the principle that people in work, people who want to be in work, people who are formerly in work, have rights in society, have rights of representation from day one. And so an act, an act and the next Labour government will introduce will be the repeal of the Trade Union Act and replace it 
with positive rights at work and positive rights for trade unions to operate and the repeal of the um, Trade Union and Lobbying Act, which is designed to silence civil society organisations during an election campaign. And during the recent election campaign on May Day, Becky Long Bailey, our Shadow Business Secretary, and she does a fantastic job and I thank her for it, set out the 20 points that Labour would put forward including immediately the banning of all zero-hours contracts to give all workers rights at work from day one of their employment and the right of representation from day one. That we would introduce a real living wage recommended by the TUC of £10 an hour for all workers all across the country. Six million people in this country earn less than the living wage. Around a million are on zero hours contracts. Half of all families with anyone with disabilities in that family are living in poverty. We live in a grotesquely unequal society. We live in a time when wages in real terms are often falling and public sector wages are held back by the public sector pay cap. And so we gave the Conservatives and the DUP a golden opportunity to mend their ways. The first vote that we called for in the new parliament after the general election was a vote to end the public sector pay freeze and the pay cap. And what did they do? The DUP and the Tories flushed with a billion pounds put into Northern Ireland. I don't begrudge money going to Northern Ireland, but if there's money available for investment in Northern Ireland, then the rest of the country should get the same as well. But they got together and voted down our proposal, so they wish to continue that public sector pay cap. I get so sick of Tory MPs lining up with crocodile tears for those that have helped out in the most terrible circumstances, such as the fire at Grenfell Tower, that is the a crisis in Manchester when the bombing went off there, on London Bridge and Finsbury Park, thanking all the emergency services for all their work. We all do that. We admire them, we applaud them, we support them, we recognise the dangers they put themselves in that the rest of us may be safe. But the difference is, we also believe they should be paid properly for doing the work that they do. And if Philip Hammond, Philip Hammond on the MAR programme this morning was incapable of admitting that public sector workers were badly paid, he was then confronted with the pay slip that John McDonnell had given him of a cleaner. And he said, well, no, she's not paid very much. No, she isn't paid very much because he has imposed a public sector pay cap to make sure she's not paid very much. So we have to confront the Tories with all this and this is about developing trade unionism and rights in our society. Because Rights that we have have always come from below. I talked about toll puddle martyrs. I talked about the suffragettes. I talked about. I talk also about those that fought for LGBT rights. Those that fought for women's rights. Those that stood up against discrimination, not just in this country but around the world, and the importance of our human rights legislation. And I give this commitment: a Labour government will be totally in support of and adhere to the European Convention on Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, and of course the UN Declaration on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we will have a foreign and international policy that is based on human rights, peace, justice and democracy, because these are things that we've all developed ourselves. As you know, we've just been through a general election campaign and I want to thank everyone for everything they did in that campaign to support the Labour campaign and the manifesto on which we fought that election. I am very sorry and very sad we didn't quite succeed in winning the election. But I tell you this, we started that campaign from the moment it was announced by the Prime Minister. 
with every member of the commentariat writing us off, with almost every newspaper writing us off, with every expert and every late night comment show on television saying this was uh, r r variously the end of the Labour Party, it was a one party state from now on, there was no alternative but economic austerity and a continuation of inequality within our society. But you know what happened? Hey. People started to come together. We stood up and said, this is our offer. This is our alternative. Austerity is a decision made by politicians. It's not inevitable. Poverty is a creation of that austerity and that economic system. The poverty of many young people, the insecurity of many older people, the debts of many that have determined to get themselves an education in college or university are brought about by injustice and an unpreparedness to spend public resources on the good of all. We put that alternative out there. And in every rally I spoke at, I said, look around you at the crowd you're in. You're black, you're white, you're men, you're women, you're young, you're old, you're disabled, you're gay, you're straight, but you are together with a belief of the kind of world and kind of society that we can live in. And I also said to people, don't just, don't just knock on doors. Talk to people all the time. Change the debate. Change the discussion. Use the social media. Change the debate and the discussion into one that is about what is possible, not the impossibilists of the right in politics and the right in world economic thinking. They stood for an election on the basis that somebody was going to be strong and stable and somebody else was offering a coalition of chaos. Well, I feel perfectly strong and extremely stable and I'm very happy with my personal demeanour. And the Labour vote went up by 3 million, which is the biggest increase in support for Labour at any time since 1945. Because what we put forward was something transformational. It was about the kind of world we can live in, and it had that incredible response and resonance. And so we're going to be challenging this government, challenging them every day, all the time, on their economic record, on their ideas, and on the injustices in society. The more they retreat, the more we will attack. The longer they go on, the stronger we will be in our attack. And come an election, whenever it comes, we are ready. We are ready and campaigning and fighting in every part of the country. Because the issues I've talked about of public services, of social justice, of wages, of rights in our society are obviously crucial to all of us and our communities that we live in. But it's also, if I may say so, about the natural world in which we live as well. There are limits to what you can do to a planet. There are limits to what you can do to our natural world. And so I want to make it clear that a Labour government would invest in our natural environment. The natural world isn't something somewhere else. It's something in all of us of how we live our lives and the kind of world we want to live in. So, I want a government that will take action to protect the natural world and rural economies and rural life. The Tories have always treated rural Britain as if it's their sort of own private backyard. Well, it's not. <laughs> Labour votes all over the South West went up enormously. In a number of constituencies, Labour support more than doubled in this election. And we'll be working further on this, but I simply say this. This is a beautiful environment. Nobody could ever doubt or debate that. This is a, a stunning area of, of our country. But living in what could be on the cover of a chocolate box doesn't make you wealthy, doesn't give you a bus, doesn't mean you've got a school, doesn't mean you've got a hospital nearby. There can be just as much...
difficulty and hardship in very beautiful areas as there are in other parts of the country. And so we will develop those policies which show how we can do things very, very differently in all parts of this country. And so there are specific proposals we'll put forward which deal with agriculture, deal with sustainability of it, such as bee killing pesticides. We will stand up and stop them from privatising the Forestry Commission and selling off our, natural, our forestry heritage in this country. We will ban fracking because we believe that fracking is damaging to the environment, is very expensive and creates a permanent damage or very long-term damage to underground aquifers and water courses. We have to be respectful of the environment, so I want to lead a Labour government that doesn't, not only doesn't do fracking, but also promotes sustainable energy production and promotion of a better environment such as the planting of at least a million trees of a diverse species so we have a stronger sense of biodiversity all over the country. And we'll play our part in the rest of the world as well. Because a Labour government would not be afraid to pick up the phone to Donald Trump and say on Paris climate change talks, Donald Trump, you are wrong. If we are to survive, we have to sign up to that. And so it's also about justice in rural areas. We're celebrating farm workers and what they stood for and what they did. But farm workers are still exploited. Many are still on inadequate, insecure contracts. Many become self-employed as a way of surviving. So we will reintroduce the Agricultural Wages Board to ensure decent pay across the whole of the agriculture and food processing sector in this country. And through our National Investment Bank, through our National Investment Bank, we will be ensuring there is equality of investment across the whole country. Because we need a government that's going to do things differently, that will ensure we get tariff-free trade access to the European markets, to make sure that we do maintain all the rights on environmental, consumer and workers' protection, and that we don't allow this country, as the Tories would want, to become a sort of tax haven on the shores of Europe with a deregulated low-wage economy cooked up between Theresa May and, John and Donald Trump over a cup of tea somewhere. We will instead stand up for the rights of everybody within our our society and stand for an investment economy that works to improve the living standards of all, not further attack the living standards of those that have already seen their wages hit and cut over the past seven years of austerity. So those are the outlines of what a Labour government is determined to achieve. Our presence here today is a testament to our strength as unions all over the country, is in recognition of the huge sacrifices that was made and coming together of the kind of world we want to create. Where our children get the schools they need and deserve, where our students are not frightened of going to university by the level of debt they've got, and those that work in our National Health Service are not so exhausted and so ground down by it they feel they can carry on no longer. None of this is achieved simply. And so there would be a change in taxation under a Labour government. There would be an increase in corporate taxation levels. And there would be more money spent on our public services. And we would ensure that water, post and railways come back into public ownership where they should never have left because these things matter as to how, how we run our society and run our economy. Ours is a movement, the Labour movement was founded by people of many, value, many deeply held values and deep principles. Our Labour movement stands there for peace, 
for human rights, for social justice, as well as the day-to-day -day economic battles that we all have to face. That's what brings us together. And in this period we have, I don't know whether it's going to be weeks or months between now and the next election, I want to develop the details of our policies so that come the day, and I hope it's soon, that we're in a position to fight the election again and win a majority, we'll be then able to go into government with the support of millions of people to put the programme into practice, to transform the lives of so many and give real hope to the next generation. I always think that literature Music and imagination are a very important part of our movement. If you look at the artwork on the Union banners, listen to the music we're playing here this weekend, go to a primary school and look at children's art, Yay. and you see the joy of what they can achieve themselves together. I think a society works better when the imagination and creativity of everybody is unashamedly unleashed and unlocked. And so I am determined that we will introduce a pupil arts premium so that every child can learn a musical instrument whilst in school. And from that they will learn so much more and learn so much more about themselves. Our history our history is riddled with those that observed what went on. And I want to conclude with a few lines from a poet. You may not all have heard of him. A man called John Clare, who lived in Northamptonshire. He was a farm worker. He was mainly self-educated. He suffered much during his life. He suffered much mental illness and stress. And his poetry is very varied very exciting and very interesting, but he observed the brutality of what was going on in his part of Northamptonshire, which wasn't that different to what was going on elsewhere. The enclosure of common land, the loss of security of the people, the agricultural workers that lived in those communities, and the way in which the natural world that he so loved was being destroyed by the industrialization of agriculture. And he wrote these words, this is about enclosure, enclosure of the common land. Enclosure came and trampled on the grave of labour's rights and left the poor a slave. And birds and bees and flowers without a name all sighed when lawless laws enclosure came. That was John Clare describing what happened then. There are many people around the world who fight for their rights, fight for their justice, fight for the kind of world they want to live in. We are not an insular movement or an insular people. We're here to work with others all around the world. The banners today show all of that. We're here to include all people in our society in the onward march for justice, for social justice, and ensuring everybody can reach their potential, that every child's creativity is excited and possible and they achieve their very best in their lives. And you know what? That kind of society works better together. That kind of society ensures that we all do better and better understand each other. Whereas a society based solely on individualism, solely on greed, solely on profit, can never achieve that sense of justice that we all aspire to. Those six labourers probably didn't realise the complete significance of what they were doing at that time. They were angry at what was happening to them. They've given us a legacy we have all to live up to. And here today, in Tollpuddle, in 2017, we're living up to that legacy and we're declaring ourselves ready, able and very determined to fight for justice in this country and around the world and campaign to win against